morning. It's a great pleasure to be here and to uh, have the opportunity to talk to you a bit about the science that we've been doing over the last number of years here at Berkeley. And um, I wanted to start off by uh, introducing the concept of gene editing by uh, showing this beautiful uh, structure of the double helix of DNA. So DNA is the chemical that stores all of the information necessary to make life possible. And back in the 1950s, when scientists were initially discovering this beautiful structure and thinking about how it could explain the transfer of genetic information over many generations and the evolution of life, this was, I think, really the birth of the idea that this information wasn't static at all, but in fact is quite malleable in cells. It's, and you heard about in Angelica Amon's talk this morning, it's uh, information that changes over time, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. And scientists have been imagining ways that it might be possible to control that change, to actually recode life, if you will, to change the DNA sequence so precisely that we could both understand fundamental questions about genetics, but also control those genetics, be able to do things like cure genetic disease by altering the code that leads to disease in cells or tissues or, or whole patients or organisms. And uh, this was not a topic that I was working on at all in my own lab. I've, as you heard from that uh, introduction from Michael, I've been interested for a long time in how molecules that are chemically related to DNA but, but different in important ways called RNA molecules, how these pieces of, of genetic material called RNA can influence the flow of genetic information in cells. And we've worked on various questions to do with this over the years in the lab. And, um, and what uh, led me to get involved in genome editing was actually a serendipitous involvement in a, uh, in, in a question that seems might seem unrelated uh, to gene editing, which is basically understanding how bacteria fight viral infection. And I got interested in this question because of a colleague here at Berkeley, Jill Banfield, who had noticed that bacteria had what appeared to be an adaptive immune system, something that nobody thought bacteria would be capable of uh, encoding in their own DNA. And she contacted me about 12 years ago now to explain this idea to me. Nobody had done any experiments in the field at the time. And as a biochemist and a structural biologist, I got intrigued about whether this bacterial immune system might involve molecules of RNA. And that's how we got started working on something called CRISPR. And if you've seen the word, if you've seen this acronym CRISPR, or if you've seen it in the media, you might uh, wonder if it's a new kind of cracker or a place to store your vegetables. Uh, but actually, it's an acronym that stands for a place in the genome of bacteria where pieces of viral DNA are stored over time. And here's how it works. So uh, this is a, a, a segment of a bacterial uh, cell that you're looking at that's being infected by a virus. And when this virus infects the cell, it injects its genetic material, its DNA, into the cell. Now, if this cell has a CRISPR uh, uh, pathway in, encoded in the DNA, it has a place in the DNA where it can store little bits of viral sequence. And so those pieces of virus DNA are integrated into the CRISPR locus, this part of the genome, in a particular pattern that allows the cell to recognize that as a vaccine. It's essentially a sort of a, you could think of it as a DNA vaccination card. It's a place that stores a genetic record of past infection. And the cell can then uh, make a copy of that CRISPR sequence in the form of RNA. It's, a, it's sort of a transient copy of this genetic material that's made in the cell, and it gets processed down to shorter bits of RNA that each include a sequence derived from a virus. And those RNA molecules called CRISPR RNAs and are, are uh, recognized by proteins encoded by CRISPR-associated or Cas genes. And together, these protein RNA complexes can survey the cell looking for places in a DNA molecule that match the sequence in the CRISPR RNA. And once that match is found, the proteins that are brought along by the CRISPR RNA can cut up these DNA molecules and lead to destruction. 
So if you look at this pathway, it's a fantastic way that bacteria can acquire immunity to their infectious agents and then program proteins, these Cas proteins, to find and destroy those viral DNAs should they try to infect the cell in the future. And, uh, and so in the process of studying this uh, pathway, I started a collaboration with Emmanuel Charpentier, a co-recipient of the Breakthrough Prize back in 2015. And together, we began investigating the mechanisms by which this adaptive immune system can function, and in particular, how it can program proteins to find and cut DNA. We thought that was a fascinating question, but very much a fundamental question that we didn't uh, have any, any designs on turning it into a technology at the time. We just wanted to understand how it worked. And so in collaboration with Emmanuel's lab, two fabulous students that were working with us at the time, Martin Jinek, a postdoc in my lab, and Chris Chylinski, a student with, working with Emmanuel, teamed up to investigate the function of a specific protein called Cas9 that came to our attention as a molecule in many bacteria that can be programmed with CRISPR RNAs and provide protection to cells from future infection. And in the course of investigating how this protein works, we recognize that it is an enzyme, it's a, it's a chemically active protein that works by recognizing a 20-letter sequence in a DNA molecule. And so what you can see on this cartoon is uh, the DNA is uh, right here, opening up uh, inside the Cas9 protein, which is the blue molecule. And that recognition site occurs at a place that matches the 20 letter sequence in a CRISPR RNA molecule, this molecule right here. So in bacteria, that would be a, an RNA that was made as a copy of the sequence recorded in the CRISPR array. And then together with a second molecule of RNA called tracer, the red molecule, these RNAs bind to Cas9, so they form a chemical complex that allows this protein to open up the DNA at the site of recognition and use two chemically active sites to cut each strand of the DNA double helix. Now in bacteria, this is a fantastic way to destroy a virus because the bacterial cell after the DNA has been cut can degrade those broken DNA molecules and um, destroy the virus from producing fur few, uh, few further copies of itself. But in the laboratory, we realized that this system could actually be simplified. And by understanding the details of how it worked chemically, Martin Jinek in my lab was able to combine these two separate RNA molecules into what we called a single guide RNA that would contain the programming information on one end, that gold uh, bar there for recognition of DNA, and the handle for binding to Cas9 on the other end. And this part of the RNA stays constant in every case. And then as, as a scientist working in the lab, we could change the sequence of RNA on this end to allow any DNA molecule to be recognized at a particular place in the sequence to allow precise cutting by Cas9. So this was kind of a cool thing, and when we realized how this worked, it was really exciting to understand how bacteria could use this programmable enzyme to fight infection. But it also led to a bigger idea, and that was that because this protein can be easily programmed to make double-stranded breaks in DNA, this led to the idea that it could be harnessed as a powerful technology for something called genome editing because it could trigger cells to repair broken DNA in a way that doesn't happen in bacteria. And just to explain that briefly, uh, this uh, allowed us to, to take the ideas that were coming from this very niche area of biology, studying this CRISPR immune system, and bring them together with a large body of work from many labs over the last couple of decades who had been studying how DNA repair happens in human and plant and animal cells. And what was known from that body of research is that when a double-stranded break occurs in an animal or a plant cell, rather than leading to rapid destruction of the DNA, like happens typically in bacteria, in these types of cells, the cell can detect the broken DNA and fix it, and in the process, introduce a small or sometimes a large change to the DNA sequence 
and do it precisely at the place where the DNA was broken. And so this had led to uh, earlier technologies for genome editing that relied on proteins that could be built and, and, uh, and um, designed to recognize and cut particular DNA sequences, but they were cumbersome to use. And the beautiful thing about the CRISPR-Cas9 technology is that it's a simple way to introduce a break in DNA precisely so that the cellular repair can take over and edit the DNA, edit the genome. And this is a video that illustrates how we imagine that this uh, system actually works inside of a cell like ours that has the DNA in, in, uh, encased in the nucleus. So we're zooming into the nucleus here. You can see the DNA packaged in chromatin, so it's wrapped around proteins. And amazingly, the Cas9 enzyme with its little pr uh, piece of RNA that tells it where to go, it's the zip code that tells it where to go in the genome, searches through all of that DNA, finds a matching sequence to the guide RNA, and then opens up the double helix and generates a blunt break in the helix, leaving those ends available for recognition by repair proteins that can come in, and this is where the magic happens, and, um, and fix the break in this example by integrating a new piece of genetic information at the site of the break. And so over the last six years since we first published this work, the technology has taken off and been adopted globally for a wide variety of applications, really across all fields of biology. It's been truly amazing to see what scientists are doing creatively with this technology. And very briefly, I just want to give you a sense of where I see this going in the future. I think the field of technology development continues to advance very rapidly, so we see new iterations of CRISPR tools coming along virtually every week or month. We know that there are many opportunities in biomedicine, agriculture, and industrial biotechnology using gene editing, and I'll give you just one quick example that illustrates the, the power of this tool. And finally, I think there's some very important ethical and regulatory challenges that we as a society now face, given that we have a powerful way to control our own evolution and the evolution of basically everything that we interact with in our uh, biological environment. So um, to just give you a sense of where the technology is going, it's been possible to discover many different natural forms of CRISPR-Cas enzymes, as well as to develop new ones in the lab. And this is a, an example of some recent enzymes that I've been able to find in collaboration with Jillian Banfield here at Berkeley. We're investigating how these proteins with their guide RNAs are able to form structures that interrogate the genome and find uh, sequences for cutting or other kinds of chemical modification. And in this example, we know that uh, this is just showing uh, that uh, there's lots of interesting chemical variety that we find in nature, including um, as, we find the, as we find proteins that are smaller in size, we find that their RNA components tend to get bigger. And that prevent, presents some interesting opportunities, I think, technologically to think about how we can it, deliver these types of entities into cells for applications across biology. I also want to point out that as we've been investigating the molecular mechanisms of CRISPR-Cas enzymes, we've discovered new activities, new chemical properties that nobody understood these proteins to have. And those in themselves lend them, uh, are, are uh, harnessable as uh, biotechnology tools. And this is one interesting direction that the field is going right now in using new CRISPR-Cas enzymes for point of care detection, meaning rather than altering a genome, we're using them actually to detect nucleic acids, meaning DNA and RNA molecules in patient samples in a uh, real-time application that allows detection of infectious particles in, uh, in in uh, urine or uh, saliva samples, as well as in the future, possibly detecting uh, DNA that comes from uh, tumors in uh, people that might have uh, cancer. I wanted to very briefly mention a, um, an exciting uh, uh, direction that the field is going in terms of treating genetic disease. 
And this is work from Eric Olson's lab at the University of Texas, where he's been using animal models of muscular dystrophy to investigate how you could use gene editing to repair the DNA and allow a protein that, in the case of muscular dystrophy, is not uh, produced in people and leads to muscular degeneration, and then uh, edit the DNA so that this protein called dystrophin can now be produced. And you can do this by using these CRISPR-Cas scissors to, to cut out the defective part of the DNA and allow the repair to happen in such a way that this dystrophin protein can now be generated in muscle tissue. And just to show you a very dramatic example of this um, in a dog model of muscular dystrophy, and this is work that was published recently in Science Magazine and that Eric Olson presented at a conference that I attended in New York a couple of months ago, he showed this slide, which shows on the left-hand side uh, normal tissue. So these are uh, muscle, muscle tissue that's producing this dystrophin protein stained with green, so you can see it there. It's not produced in uh, dogs that have this uh, mutation that mimics what happens in humans that have muscular dystrophy. And then if the, these animals are untreated, of course, when you look in their muscle tissue over time, they're not making dystrophin and they have muscle degeneration. And you can see this as a loss of use of their limbs. But in dogs that were treated, and they were treated by a single injection of a virus that produced the CRISPR-Cas9 molecules to edit the DNA appropriately, you can see now that this muscle tissue from these dogs, two different animals here, is producing dystrophin. And, um, and if you are really interested in this, I encourage you to go and look at the video of these dogs that Eric showed, and it's on his website, that shows that these dogs that are treated are now uh, able to use their limbs in a way that the untreated dogs are not. It's really profound, and I think it shows the future, what's coming. It's not there today, but we have an opportunity, I think, to use this technology to not only treat uh, people that have these types of diseases, but in the future to actually cure uh, these diseases. And, um, my light is flashing, and I'm just going to close by pointing out that uh, the ethical challenges are, are big, and one of them, I think, is the idea that in the future it may, be, be, may, be the, it may become the norm, actually, to use uh, gene editing not only in kids and adults, but also in the germline, meaning in a way that passes along changes in the DNA to future generations. And this is a a very active topic of discussion right now, and in fact, I'm off to a meeting in a month in Hong Kong that will follow up on this report that was released la uh, last year by the National Academies to discuss how that kind of application should be regulated and, um, and, and, and how should we, uh, as a scientific community, think about uh, regulating it and controlling it in the future. So stay tuned, there will be certainly be um, press releases about this meeting coming up about this topic, and uh, it's an area of, of very active discussion at the moment. And I'm just going to conclude by pointing out that RNA-guided gene editing is a powerful way to manipulate genomes, continuing to advance very rapidly. Applications are going to depend on controlling the outcomes of the editing, including uh, both the chemical outcomes and um, the societal outcomes and how we think about the future of this uh, use of this technology. And finally, I think over the next one to 10 years, we will all of us experience uh, rapid uh, advances and applications of gene editing in areas that are going to affect us, not only biomedical, but also in agriculture and applications in, industri in, uh, in industrial biotechnology. Thanks very much. Although this is somewhat regulatory related, do you think that you know the issue of patents on such modifications? So in the plant world, you know, making all these genetically modified plants, even though in nature the same thing could happen, just would take a, either a lot more time or randomly. What are your thoughts on that? I didn't. I didn't quite understand the question. You're asking oh, about the patents? fact that we're going to be making all these genome edited plants, and plants, they're probably yeah. going to be under patents, so yes. that there's ownership even though genome editing itself, that, that making that mutation could have happened naturally or just takes longer. 
So do you think we should be uh, regulating those kinds of plants? Or because it happens in nature anyway, it's basically natural? The thing about, well, yeah, it's, it's an interesting uh, question that also gets into the definition of a genetically modified organism, right? And as you point out, plant breeders currently introduce random mutations into seeds and then select for traits. It takes a long time and, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's a random process that brings along a lot of undesired changes to DNA along with the desired trait. And so what gene editing offers is a way to introduce changes precisely and without all of the collateral uh, you know, uh, mutations that, that come along in typical breeding. Uh, should that be a patentable uh, outcome? You know, I think for companies to want to invest money in something like that, they have to have a way of protecting what they do. So that's the, I mean, that's the whole purpose of the patenting system. And I think the bigger question is how genetically modified organisms are going to be defined and regulated in different countries. And as you may know, that that's a topic of big debate right now. And there are differences across, especially between Europe, Asia, and, and the United States. Thank you.